We keep hearing the phrase flatten the curve, and it essentially means to spread out the number of new cases of the coronavirus over a long period of time. That way, hospitals are not overwhelmed and people can have better access to the healthcare system. Here's the image of two curves. The steep purple curve shows how quickly a disease can infect so many people over a short period of time. And that's what happens if aggressive steps are not taken, such as social distancing and quarantines. This image was used in a pre-pandemic study in 2007, prepared by the U.S. Health Department. And now we are joined live by someone who knows about this graph really well. Dr. Drew Harris is a population health analyst at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Dr. Harris, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Dr. Harris, we know that you created your own version of this graph so people can understand exactly what flatten the curve means. And your graph went viral on Twitter um, in late February. Can you tell us exactly the story behind your particular graph? Well, the, the graph, as you showed, has two different curves. One is a curve of new cases that are growing out of control, where the disease is spreading without any limits. So you see that very high peak in exponential growth. And the other one is much gentler, a slope. And the difference between those two curves is, as you say, the capacity of our healthcare system to respond to the virus. And if we have too many sick people showing up on the same day, then that means there's not enough beds in the hospital, not enough ventilators to provide support for people. And essentially, we have to begin to open up additional facilities or treat people in the parking lot or maybe people don't even get care. It also represents the ability of a society to respond, because if you think about it, in that big peak could be uh, police officers and other first responders, important and essential personnel within our communities. And if too many of them get sick at the same time, then society has trouble functioning. So it's very important that we make sure this disease doesn't spread so quickly that we are overwhelmed by it. All right. Um now, countries all around the world have put mitigating measures in place. Um, how effective are these so far, in your opinion? Well, it depends on the country and depends on exactly what they did. So the countries that have the best best response so far, were able to implement testing of people that they suspected of having disease right away. And when you test someone and find out that they have COVID-19, then you can isolate them, separate them while you treat them and keep them away from infecting other people. Also, you begin to trace the people that they came in contact with in the days prior to them showing the symptoms. Because COVID-19 is a, is a very uh, dangerous virus in that people can spread it even before they know they're sick. And in in fact, we're learning that people are spreading it without even knowing they're sick. So the more testing you can do, the faster you can identify these people and begin to limit the spread. Other communities, other countries have done a more a broad approach, which is basically shut everything down. Assume everyone has the virus, keep them in their homes so that they're not spreading it out on the streets and in the stores and the markets and the theaters. Close everything down until we, are, we have an opportunity to get a handle on where the disease is spreading and then slowly open things up once the initial wave of the disease is through the community. Right. In your opinion, Dr. Harris, which country is doing this most effectively? I would say that South Korea and New Zealand have both been very effective at limiting the spread of the disease. And we can contrast that with Italy and, unfortunately, the United States, in which we have not done a really good job of getting ahead of the disease. The reason for flattening the curve is that it buys you time time. And time is the most precious commodity that you can have during an outbreak. If you have time, that's time to prepare. That's time to make personal protective equipment for the healthcare workers. That's time to build extra hospitals if you need to. That's time to begin to manufacture testing kits so that you can identify those who are sick with the disease. Um, one thing noticeable about the graph is that there aren't actually any figures either on the x-axis or the y-axis. So, you know, it's very effective in terms of uh, illustrative purposes, right? Um, given that the world has been battling this uh, virus for almost five months now, 
it, would it be possible to add figures to the graph now in terms of the number of days and number of cases? Absolutely. You have to remember when I originally designed that graphic back in, I think it was 2007 or 8, we didn't even know that coronavirus was going to be a pandemic. We knew that there were coronaviruses, but no one thought that that was going to be the disease that's going to be spreading around the world. The th disease we were worried about back then was influenza. So that graphic was really designed for influenza and our thinking about that. But there were no numbers because it really applies to any kind of an airborne infectious disease and how it would spread through a community. Now that we have more information, we are, and the experts are, developing very specific models that input the current knowledge of how this disease spreads, how quickly it can spread from one person to another, and under what conditions and they make much more precise models. And that's where you're seeing the very specific predictions as to how many, how many cases you're going to see and when you're going to be seeing the peak. But all of that depends upon what the people do. I like to describe COVID-19 or any kind of a pandemic. It's like a hurricane or a cyclone that's coming, coming to the country. The only difference is that unlike a hurricane or a cyclone, we can't change the course. It's going to hit where it is going to hit, and it's going to be as strong as it's going to be. But with this storm, with COVID-19, the way people act, our behaviors, and if we follow the social distancing and the stay-at-home guidelines, we can take this storm and take it down from a Category 5 to a 4, a 3, a 2, or a 1, all by our own actions. So that's where we need to have to focus our efforts. And depending on how effective people are, the models will begin to reflect that. We can add those numbers to the chart. All right, Dr. Harris, here in the Philippines, we're only about, uh, only just about to start rolling out uh, mass testing. What does this mean for us here, and what can we expect in the coming days and weeks? Well, you know, most of the testing that most countries is, are doing is um, testing of people when they show at the hospital with with a um, with symptoms. So you want to find out if they have it when they get there. But we need to start testing people out in the community, the people who aren't very sick, the people who think, well, maybe I just have a cold or some other condition. Those are the people we need to be testing. And we also need to be spot checking people throughout the communities, especially in the more marginal communities where the risk is so high. Unfortunately, this disease, like so many diseases, are going to impact poor people, people with chronic medical conditions, older people, the more vulnerable society. So those are the ones we need to be testing to identify who's sick in those communities, put them into another facility, separate them so that they can't spread the disease to healthy or non-infected people within that community. That aggressive testing is going to require a lot of people, a lot of test kits, and a lot of effort. All right, uh, Dr. Drew Harris, thank you so much for giving time to CNN Philippines this morning. We appreciate it. You're welcome.